Are we ready? <laughs> <laughs> Something yeah. going on over there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we made an extra garland for two. <laughs> I don't need two, thank you. <laughs> okay. Guru Maharaj, and if the light up here can go down, you can see the screen better. There's a whole bunch of different lights. Which is good, good, good. Okay. So, the first evening was in Flint. That's some distance from here, so probably some of you weren't with us. Who was not with us two evenings ago? Okay. Too bad. <laughs> no. Um, we did a, a little introduction to the topic of Dhruva Maharaj. And there was somebody, an American fellow there that didn't know anything, so we had to do a whole lot of beginning things. So Dhruva, um, we're going to see the family tree shortly. Dhruva lived not only during Satya Yuga, but in the first Satya Yuga of the first Manu, Swayambhuva Manu. In the first day of Brahma's life, the first very, very, very beginning of creation. We heard some single word statements that represent or characterize Dhruva. Very determined, um, capable of incredible austerity, lots of faith. He moved from mixed to pure devotion. He became realized in the fullness of Vedic knowledge without even going to school. Okay. <laughs> By mercy of Narada and Vishnu and his mother. We heard about the, the power of bhakti to bring one to the Supreme Lord and reveal the Supreme Lord. We heard a lot of nice things to, to, to get a picture of the benefits of hearing the Dhruva story. In the whole of Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu particularly liked hearing Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj, both of them exemplifying the char characteristics and qualities of pure bhakti, Shuddha bhakti. They didn't, at least Dhruva didn't start there, but he, so the, the, a, a value in hearing the story of Dhruva is, how do you get there? From, it, it's very relevant to us, we're mixed devotees, we have bhakti inside and we have other things inside and <coughs> accepting that the goal is to come to Shuddha bhakti, there's steps and there's elements and there's principles involved in transitioning to that Shuddha Bhakti position. So the Dhruva Maharaj story is, illustrates a number of these points very nicely. Um, it covers five chapters in Canto 4, chapters 8 through 12. We're obviously not going to cover all of that. We're going to begin chapter 8, texts 1 through 24 this evening. And maybe you'll, you'll be inspired to go further. So the most no, noteworthy or celebrated part of Dhruva's life was when he was a small boy. And uh, these first 24 verses not that our acharyas have labeled like this or identified like this, but I have, for purpose of presentation, 
These terms react or respond are terms that are used in counseling, I've been informed. And the reacting is when people go into a negative zone and get stuck, and responding is when misfortune happens and they can move on. They understand how to move forward. Um, a basic reality that we all have to deal with is the place where we reside is a place of opposites or duality. The spiritual world is a realm of that which is absolute. And it, it, that absolute means many things. The name of Krishna is Krishna. The form of Krishna is Krishna. The qualities of Krishna are Krishna. There's no distinction between the object and the attributes of an object. It's absolute. But in this world, it's a world of duality. Wherever there's one thing, the opposite of that one thing exists. It's now night. Wait a while. Something's going to happen. It'll become morning, then it'll become day, then it'll become afternoon, then it'll become evening, and then it becomes night. Wherever there's, there, there, it's, it's winter season, then comes summer season. And then when something is wet and something is dry, something is up, something is down, some, there's happiness and distress and pleasure and pain. And if you, ever, living entities want happiness. Because by nature, we're ananda, such as ananda. We want happiness. But, if that happiness is thought to be happiness within this realm of duality, by that happiness choice, we're buying ourselves into unhappiness. Because it's the nature of the place. As long as there's this, there's that. That's what duality means. So, we all it's very practical. We all have to learn how to deal with the place where we reside. And, and in specifically, in specific, the unhappiness of this place. Because we want happiness, and if we don't handle the, the other part of this duality well, um, we're in trouble. We're, we're, we'll, we'll be dysfunctional. So it's an important lesson, or to get to the realm of the absolute abode of Krishna, we have to learn how to navigate our way through this place. And the Dhruva story, this particular section, helps us understand how to do that. So now we're ready to begin. Um, the speaker in third canto and the whole of fourth canto and going beginning parts of the fifth canto it's Maitreya speaking to Vidura the four great Kumara sages headed by Sanaka as well as Narada Ribhu, Hamsa Aruni and Yati all sons of Brahma did not live at home, but became Urdhva Reta, or Naishtika Brahmacharis, unadulterated celibates. Now this is this going back, because it's important, uh, the context. When Vidura met Maitreya, after their wonderful, lovely exchange with one another, Vidura posed some questions. And the first question he asked was, please describe how the personality of Godhead creates this world of duality, this temporary material creation. So it's, it's a sarga question, and after he creates what is Brahma do, that's the this sarga topic. Those are two of the ten topics in the whole Srimad Bhagavatam, covered in Canto 3. And then 
The third topic that's discussed is the manus, or manvantara. So the first manu is presented. And it's Swaibhava Manu and his two daughters, we'll see the chart shortly, his two daughters, it's discussed in Canto 3. It's going to be discussed here again in this chapter 8 of Canto 4. But now this is going back to some Vistarga topics. So I'll say it again. Sarga is what Vishnu does. This Sarga is what Brahma does. And Manu fills up the universe that Brahma creates. So, this is now st still speaking the Sarga topic, what Brahma does. Because Brahma had some sons, directly born from his body, without the assistance of his wife. And these, these are ones mentioned in this verse, first verse of the chapter, they, they didn't become married. Devahuti became married to Kardamoni, and Devahuti and Kardamoni had daughters, and, and Kapila Dev is their son. So next, verses 2, 3, and 4 are going to go further back in the Sarga topic and describe features of destruction that Brahma has to create because when he makes the creation, he has to create the bad stuff among the good stuff because the creation has both because it's the place of duality. So here's what it says. This is text 5. My dear Vidura, I have summarily explained the causes of devastation. Verses 2 through 4 are causes of devastation. We're going to go back and look at them. <laughs> One who hears this description three times attains piety and washes the sinful contamination from the soul. So to hear about the causes of devastation three times is good. And in that section, um, text 5, Prabhupada writes in his purport, devastation takes place because of irreligion and falsity. So now we're going to go back to 2 through 4. Uh, in text 2, it's stated that Brahma gave birth to irreligion, a son, and falsity, a daughter. And these two had an incestuous relationship and it wasn't a good result. Uh, bluffing and cheating were produced. And from them, greed and cunning, and from them, anger and envy, and from them, quarrel and harsh speech. And from them came death and fear. So these are forces of devastation. If you're going to have a universe, if you're going to be Brahma, you have to be ready to do the bad stuff along with the good stuff. Because it's a thankless task, but that's part of creation. It, it has this duality feature. Now we're going to see some of these again. In fact, at the end of this class, I'm going to give you a printout that has this chart as forces of devastation or causes of devastation. And we're going to discuss how that plays into the Dhruva story. Vishwanath asked the following question. How does knowing all this help one become pious? <laughs> knowing all the bad stuff. And because here's what the verse says. Here three times and washes away sinful contamination from the soul. You attain piety. And he explains Vishwanath explains, by knowledge one can avoid these items. But it doesn't mean that you have knowledge and you're going to avoid these items. 
because some people know these things and they do these things anyways. They do devastation things anyways. So when you get the handout at the end of the class, that's what this says, you'll probably most of you will take prasadam. So while you're sitting taking prasadam, talk and discuss with the person next to you what you find in this printout how these forces interact with one another and bring about little devastations like we're going to hear in this story. Uh, Suruchi is being influenced by those forces of devastation in a small way, but it's, for Dhruva it's devastating. So stay tuned. That was verse, verses 1 through 5. And now in 6 through 8, we saw this chart yesterday, those of you who were with us. Here's little Dhruva down here. And his father is Uttanapada. And his mother is Suniti. And Suniti was the elder queen. Dhruva was the firstborn son. And according to Vedic culture, the firstborn son is entitled by law to become the next king. And the younger queen, her name was Saruchi, and she had a son who was younger than Dhruva, and she was envious. She wanted her son to become the king. Sound familiar? Sounds like Mahabharata. So, um, Uttanapada, the family tree here is, he had a brother, elder brother Priyavrata, and he had three sisters. And Devahuti, Prasuti, and Akuti by name. Devahuti we heard about in Canto 3. We don't hear so much about the other two anywhere, at least in the Bhagavatam. And they're two, two brothers, three sisters. They're the sons and daughters of the children of Swamuvamanu and his wife Shatarupa and they're directly born from the body of Brahma, so that's the family tree. Dhruva, fourth generation from Brahma. So father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and then Vishnu. Interesting is Kapila Dave is his first cousin. Maybe some of you have some first cousins. Dhruva's father's sister, Devahuti, was the mother of Kapila Dev. So they were like, they were contemporaries and first cousins. And the, 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 the world was just kind of new. It wasn't like a lot of people, a lot of big things happening. I'm really curious. Did they ever meet? <laughs> what was that like? But it gives you an idea of you know, how elevated was Dhruva and fortunate in Kapila. So that's the first eight verses of chapter eight. And here's a, an image, a painting of Uttanapada, who had his first, excuse me, second queen, but favorite queen was Suruchi, and Suniti, his first queen, but she wasn't just like less favored. Literally, she was abandoned. It wasn't nice. She didn't stay in the palace. She stayed somewhere. The king didn't even know where she was. And he didn't even care where she was because she was too much attached to the, first, to the second queen. It was a very unpleasant circumstance. But as far as Dhruva was concerned, he had equal regard and affection for both his mothers. So, Niti, living off somewhere, and Saruchi, the one that was nicely dressed and in the palace. Now, this is there's a little bit subjective, uh, soul searching. Uh, what makes the difference between reacting and responding? <laughs> in somewhere in the past of your life, has anyone ever mistreated you? Probably the answer is yes. 
What about, have you ever, in some cases, hurt or mistreated somebody? Maybe unintentionally, but has that ever happened? And when either of those happened, what was your response? How did you feel about that? And for that matter, what makes one react or respond? Because they're different. And we'll explore that now. So, what's going to be described is four different personality types. <coughs> the first one is a, a big time reactor. And that's Suruchi, the younger queen. So, the scene opens, text 8, where Dhruva wants to sit on the lap of his father. He sees his younger brother, Dhruva is just five, so his brother, younger brother is less than five, whatever that age is, and his younger brother is sitting on his father's lap. So, little boy, he wants to also sit on his father's lap. But when Dhruva, while he was trying to get up on the lap of his father, Saruchi, his stepmother became very envious of the child. Is envious because she knew he's going to be the next king and I want my son to be the next king. So she was envious. And she had great pride. Her pride was, I'm the favorite queen. So much favorite, we don't even know where the other queen is. And we don't care because she's proud of her being the favorite. And spite. She's got a sharp edge to her. She began to speak so as to be heard by the king himself. And take a look at her body language, even if you don't know what she's going to say, the body language just says it all. She's um, a nasty lady. Prabhupada explains in the purport that these two things, envy and pride, they're like two sides of the same coin. One who has pride is envious of what other people have. One who is envious of what other people have somehow finds in themselves to be proud of whatever they have. They, they're good companions and she had both. So these forces of destruction are at play in her. They're created by Brahma they're forces of destruction of the universe, but they're little destructions and because there's forces that are at play. So it goes like this, pride and cheating, greed and cunning, anger and envy, and harsh speech. And Druva's husband happens to be on the receiving end. Little boy. Um, these causes of devastation are forces that act in those that react instead of respond. We don't have to choose to react, but if one does react, there's a force acting. So Suniti Suruchi, when she spoke her very, very harsh words, it hurt Dhruva very much, as you see from the picture and um, he leaves the palace. Here's three verses where she says her nasty thing. My dear child, you do not deserve to sit on the throne of the, or on the lap of the king. Surely, you are also the son of the king, but because you did not take your birth from my womb, you are not qualified to sit on your father's lap. My dear child, you are unaware that you were born not of my womb, but of another woman. Didn't even mention her name. Therefore, you should know that your attempt is doomed to failure. You are trying to fulfill the desire which is impossible to fulfill. 
If you at all desire to rise to the throne of the king, then you have to undergo severe austerities. First of all, you must satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayana, and then when you are favored by him because of such worship, you shall have to take your next birth from my womb. Now what does a five-year-old boy understand about all this talk? <laughs> Probably not a whole lot, but um, he gets the mood. And basically she say, you're going to have to die and then get good fortune from the person that we got it. Take your next birth from my womb, then you can sit on your father's lap. Get down. I've got a nickname for her. I call her Sue Nasty. <laughs> Very nasty. <clears throat> her pride is, uh, knows no boundaries. Although Krishna is the giver of liberation, fullness of spiritual awakening, she's relegating the mercy that Krishna can really give is taking birth from her womb. So she's bigger than Krishna. You really get Krishna's good fortune, then you'll come to me and become my child. And Krishna's, she's above Krishna, Krishna's below her. So that's Suruchi's reaction to seeing Dhruva trying to climb on the lap of his father. And um, Uttanapada, the father, has a different kind of reaction. You don't have, there's only, not only one way to react. Um, here's what he does. The sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, as a snake, when struck by a stick, breathes very heavily, Dhru Maharaj, having been struck by the strong words of his stepmother, began to breathe very heavily because of great anger. So he's reacting. And he's got this pretty strong negative emotion going on. When he saw that his father was silent and did not protest, immediately at the palace and went to his mother. Now, the reacting of Uttanapada uh, was one of negligence and indifference to his son. And what can cause one to do something like that? According to the teaching, of the Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, it's weakness of heart or hridaya dorbalya in the language of Bhagavad Gita. And his weakness of heart was undue attachment to Suruchi. Too much attached. Too much attached. So much attached that his heart had become weakened. That is, he knew what he should do and later he's going to lament that he didn't do what he knew he should do. Just human to show affection to a son that's insulted like this, or, or more. But he did nothing because undue attachment. And the result of that weakness of heart, not only he didn't, uh, he, as a father, giving protection to his son, or as a king, giving protection to citizen, he didn't do either. Neglect of duty. That's exactly the, the position that Arjun was in. You know, of course, the, the, the drama was different, the dynamic was different, but we, neglect of duty. Now we're going to see a different model, and the model of Suniti, that's the mother of Dhruva, and she's going to show us what it's like to respond instead of reacting. Now one of the things that we saw the other evening was this slide. 
one of the six benefits that Prabhupada writes about. Hearing the Dhruva story generates a feeling of pure devotional service in the hearts of the hearers. So, hearing about Suniti and eventually what happened with Dhruva, this whole narration ge generated my experience is, is certifying. It generates a feeling of pure devotional service. She's, Suniti is a very special person. So some of the elements, some of the elements of react, responding instead of reacting, starts with compassion, and there's that compassion is given some direction. So uh, here's the next verse, next two verses. When Dhruva Maharaj reached his mother, his lips were trembling in anger and he was crying very grievously. He had some strong negative emotions. Queen Suniti immediately lifted her son onto her lap. Natural for a mother to do that. While the palace residents who had heard all the harsh words of Suruchi related everything in detail, thus Suniti also became greatly aggrieved. And then she has other negative emotions besides grief. This incident was unbearable to Suniti's patience. She began to burn as if in a far forest fire and in her grief, she became just like a burnt leaf and so lamented. As she remembered the words of his, her co-wife, her bright, lotus-like face filled with tears. So she's not unfamiliar with negative emotions. It's not a, a no-no to, to have some experience like this. But what does she turn to? So the first thing she does is an act of compassion, motherly compassion. She comforts her son. She extends uh, her empathy, acknowledging his pain, and she does her motherly thing. Then, very important, the very next thing she <coughs> does and doesn't do is she looks for a solution and she doesn't like scream and yell and rant and curse and carry on. She doesn't react. She feels a negative emotion but she's um, searching for a solution, a solution orientation. This is um, counseling talk. Some people over here, they see the problem and they get captured by the problem, immersed in the problem, and can't see their way out of the problem, and they implode with negative emotions about the problem, the hurt, the pain, the incident, the mistreatment, and so forth. And a response option is she feels the pain so the, in the language of counseling life throws rocks at you and it hurts and there's a reacting behavior or there's a response behavior and the response behavior is looking for solutions now that that's counseling talk here we are in Detroit so this fits this is a Henry Ford quote. <laughs> Don't find fault, find a remedy. And it's not like a, a, you know, a, a new idea. This is something that I learned as a teenager. I'll share with you. I learned as a teenager that any two-bit teenager can just give them a microphone or give them your ear and they'll tell you all the things that are wrong in the world, especially with the older generation. 
and on and on and on. Any cubic teenager can do that. But as a teenager, my thought was, where's that teenager, where's that person who can find solutions? Real ones, not notional ones. I want to find, I want those people as my friends, not just people who can find a fault. So, Suniti was such a person. She was searching for a solution. She was also breathing very heavily, and she did not know the factual remedy for the painful situation. So then what comes next after that? <coughs> what comes next after that is taking shelter of higher principle. Because that's an option. That's a response step. And the higher principle, she's the mother. Some of you here are mothers or fathers. And you have dependents who are looking to you to help you deal with some negative emotions or you know the duality part of the world that we live in there's some un unhappiness and how to deal with it listen carefully and you not just parents we have friends that are going through a hard time and how do you help a friend that's going through a hard time listen to suniti take shelter of higher principles so one of them is what not to do and what to do my dear son, do not wish for anything inauspicious for others. Anyone who inflicts pain upon others suffers himself from that pain. This this Amangalam. Amangalam is translated by our Acharyas <clears throat> and their commentary is fault-finding. Now we know there's lots of things said in our scriptures about fault-finding. But this is, you know, one of these destructive forces. It's self-destructive. It's, it's and it's, well, it's also other destructive. <coughs> oh, son, do not find fault in others because those who have given suffering to others previously will receive the same in this life. This is Vishwanath's translation of the verse, and here's his commentary. Do not find fault among the law in your stepmother. You have experienced the results of sins you have committed in previous births. Since the person who gives suffering to others in a previous life receives it back in this life. So it's two things. Don't, per, don't, don't participate in giving, wishing pain for others because that will come back. And when pain comes to you, understand you're getting back what you did to others. Or accepting the instruments of our own karma. No, this is Detroit. So many of you most likely attended the, the Festival of Inspiration when it was running. I had a nickname for it, the Festival of Precipitation. Because <laughs> it always rained. <laughs> Mother's Day. Now it's, the, you know, the format has changed. So when it was a festival of inspiration, when I was attending at least, every year there was a keynote speaker. The keynote speaker was? Peter Burwash. So Peter Burwash is, some of you that don't know him, he's a motivational speaker, he's a leadership speaker, he's a book writer, and he speaks like he's on the tennis court. <laughs> He runs from here and runs over there because previously <laughs> he was a tennis pro. He was a teacher of tennis pros in Hawaii. That's what he did as a profession before he does, he's doing what he's doing now. And because he was doing that, he, he had money 
And many of us, Hare Krishna guys, we kind of like put our whole education and money-making thing on hold so we can just be in full-time service to Prabhupada. And that was nice, but there wasn't money to take care of necessities except for people like Peter would come forward and help. So on one occasion, he gave a $500 donation to the temple, which at that time was a, a big deal. And some days later, the person he gave the donation to ran away with, with the donation. His $500. So Prabhupada spent a lot of time in Hawaii translating. It's, there, there's, a, there's a room at the Hawaii temple. I visited there just once to spend time with Bhat Sal Prabhu, because he was the temple president at the time for a while. And, uh, it, it's a mesmerizing room. You walk in and you feel something. I mean, when I walked in, it was... I didn't know what it was. I, I just... I was staying in a room and I saw somebody going up and down the hall every morning. So I was kind of curious, what's, what's down there? Because it wasn't somebody's room, so I kind of like knocked on the door and was, I opened up the door and there was a big spacious room, like, you know, as big as keep going from, from where I'm seated all the way over to the, the, the far wall and, and wider. It was, that was Prabhupada's room. And, and a desk at the other end, and that's where he did his translation in Hawaii. He spent more time in Hawaii working on the Bhaktivedanta purports than any other place in the world. More than Los Angeles, more than Bombay, more than any other place. Because it's good weather, and it was like very peaceful. So anyway, Prabhupada was visiting Hawaii, and Peter went to see him because he had this relationship with him, and along with other things, he told him about the five hundred dollars. And as far as my memory goes, Prabhupada's response was two. It wasn't very good, but if you're don't blame the instrument of your karma. That was the main message that Peter would share every year, every year, every year when he was the keynote speaker. It's a, so it stuck for him and it stuck for me. He's, you know, what's Prabhupada going to say? Don't, be a, don't blame the instrument of your karma. Now for devotees, we don't have karma because we're doing devotional service and devotional service relieves us of our past karma. But he used that message anyway, you know, it can be a token reminder of our past karma. So, this is the advice that Suniti is giving to Dhruva. It's a statement of higher principle to live by. It's a statement that Prabhupada gave to Peter Burwash it's a very similar statement that Prabhupada gave to Bhakti Tirtha Swami. You know that story? Here's the Bhakti Tirtha Swami story. I'll do it quickly because it's a, it's, a, it's a long story, but I'll do it quickly. Um, Bhakti Tirtha Swami grew up in a ghetto in Cleveland. I mean, he, long, long, so many details of his. He had two shirts in his closet. And his friend came home with him one time and his mother saw that his shirt was torn. He said, give one of your shirts. He said, Mom, I only have two shirts. He said, yeah, but you have two, give him one. He was very poor. His, that, that's his upbringing in a, in a ghetto situation. During that period of time, the Martin Luther King era, the civil rights movement era, it became a thing where prestigious universities gave full scholarship to bright people from the black community. Bhakti Tirtha Swami got a full scholarship to Princeton University. And he graduated the valedictorian of his class and he was the president of his graduating class. He was a luminary heading for stardom in the world. <coughs> I mean, without, there's details, but I... 
And somehow or another, one of our book distribution parties from New York, we were visiting colleges distributing books, and one of the visit colleges we visited from New York was Princeton, and he got a book from our Sankirtan devotees. I know who the person was who was in that, the leader of that party. Sudanu, who is now living in Uvrindavan. At that time, he was a brahmachari. So anyway, he got a book. <clears throat> and he read the book and was, wow. And so I want to find out some more about the person who wrote this book. And so he found in the back was the address of the New York Temple. He went to New York Temple and he found that the Prabhupada was going to be visiting. And he got real excited. He came back and met Prabhupada. He became a disciple. And some time passed, living in the Hare Krishna movement instead of being a luminary in the, in the academic world. It, when civil rights people were celebrities, he was on his way to be a celebrity, he became a Hare Krishna guy. And then he um, had an opportunity to meet with Prabhupada. And he said to Prabhupada, it's like a long story, I mean, he was feeling emotion about there is racial prejudice in the Hare Krishna movement. That was his realization, ex direct experience and observation. So when he met with Prabhupada, it was, you know, said to Prabhupada, there's racial prejudice in the Hare Krishna movement. Prabhupada gave almost the same answer. He said, that's not very good. But, um, you know, if you're feeling these feelings, you know better than they are. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're in bodily concept of life and you're in bodily concept of life, who's better? Yeah. On the giving end, the receiving end, who's better? Neither is better. <laughs> better is you get out of the bodily concept of life. So, it's not exactly the same, but it's... Narada says the same thing later. <coughs> There's a reason why it's being repeated. It's being repeated because it's important. If you're stuck in the bodily conception of life, you can't go anywhere in spiritual life. Or you may think that you're going somewhere in spiritual life, you're not, if you're stuck in the bodily conception of life. Doesn't mean you don't deal with the body, but you're not the body that you're dealing with. We feed the body, we rest the body, we do, you know, we do this and that, the other thing. We bathe the body, we do things. We take care of the body, but you're not the body. We have social structures, Varnashram system, to deal with who we are, because we think we are what we are. We, we, we're, so the holistic picture of Krishna consciousness must include you're not the body and must include you have one and a mind and you have to deal with the body and the mind the covering of who you are you have to deal with it properly and when it comes to this negative thing that happens in this world of duality you have to address it properly there's a higher principle that will help you respond rather than react Here's a couple more examples. One of them is, um, you know, King Prikshit, the, the sage, Shamakrishi, putting the snake around the sage's neck, and the sage didn't react. He responded, so Prabhupada, this is a verse actually, the devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even though they are defamed, cheated, cursed, disturbed, neglected, or even killed, they are never inclined to avenge themselves. If you've killed, you really can't avenge yourself. But it's a, it's a principle that one, one has to not just tolerate, but in the world of duality, you accept it's a world of duality. And then you can respond in an appropriate way without reacting in an inappropriate way. So she goes on. Take shelter of higher principles. My dear boy, 
Whatever has been spoken by Saruchi, your stepmother, although very harsh to hear, is factual. What does she say? Take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And his mother is saying, except the, there with the karma factor that's coming your way. Therefore, <coughs> if you desire at all to sit on the same throne as your stepbrother Uttama, here's the higher principle, give up your envious attitude, that's a, one of those forces of destruction that you remember, don't indulge in it, and immediately try to execute the instruction of your stepmother. Now the stepmother's instruction was take shelter of the Supreme Personality God and perform austerity. So she's being a Paramahamsa. This lady is a Paramahamsa Vaishnava. She's able to take gold from a filthy place. She sees the filthy place. She's hurt by the filthiness of the filthy place. She's seeing the gold and she's directing her son to that higher principle. Now, there, there's most likely some more conversation than just these words, but this is giving us the essence. Here's a nice graphic. I didn't do the graphics, somebody else did it's a good one. Envy is like a hungry demon with lots of sharp teeth, which can eat away any positive quality. So, pride and envy, these two, sides of the same coin. Destroy everything good. Beware of pride because it destroys everything good. Beware of envy because it destroys everything good. So she's advising her son, take shelter of this principle. Don't indulge in envy. And take shelter of the transcendental principle, the personality of God is. So now, this slide, my experience is Devotees like to take a picture of it, so don't take a picture of it. Because it's going to be sent to you. Every one of you that is here tonight will get a copy of this slide. So this is um, the, the, the source of the, con the message here is Adi Purusha Prabhu. He's uh, one of the teachers in the VIHE in Vrindavan. And um, he visits America sometimes, he particularly visits in Potomac because he has a relationship with Ananda Vrindavan. She was headmaster of the Guru Kul and he was teaching in VHE, so he comes to visit. So he was teaching what you see in this slide. He's the author. And he was teaching Bhagavad Gita, saying Bhagavad Gita teaches this. When we don't accept an undesired event, it becomes anger. When we accept it, it becomes tolerance. When we don't accept uncertainty, it becomes fear. When we accept it, it becomes adventure. When we don't accept others' bad behavior towards us, it becomes hatred. When we accept it, it becomes forgiveness. It doesn't mean the bad behavior is just fine. But you accept the bad behavior, you go beyond the other side of the bad behavior, you extend forgiveness. That's how you do it. When we don't accept others' success, it becomes jealousy. When we accept it, it becomes inspiration. This is the key at the bottom. Acceptance is the key to handling life well. So that's one of Suniti's teachings. It's one of Bhagavad Gita's teachings. It's one of the Bhagavatam teachings. Nara is going to say it again later, you know, please understand it's important to deal with negative emotions. Acceptance doesn't mean you become a blob or somebody's punching bag or something like that. There are circumstances that you walk away from if they're abusive. But there are, and even when you walk away, it's not out of the react mode, it's the respond mode. Is that what's appropriate for someone's abusive? You don't, when you call the police, but you don't. So acceptance doesn't mean you're blocked. You're choosing the proper response. 
in this detached fashion. Vishwanath says like this, Sunita accepted her situation. My weeping has been written on my forehead by the Creator since birth. That is, you know, she's married and her husband doesn't even care for her. <coughs> so, you know, why is she sticking around? She's sticking around because she has a service to do for her son. Her son's going to be the next king of the world. She could just leave and say, I'm out of here. And I'm taking my son with me. But, you know, she's not doing that. She's staying for the, her motherly service. And she's enduring or accepting that this circumstance and the weeping that I undergo was written on my forehead. It's just a part of my karma. So who knows what my previous activities were that bring the thing about this situation. I'm accepting it. But for you, I wish you to be happy. So she's, the happiness opportunity she's giving to her son is her own quality. Her own superlative Vaishnavi quality. She goes on. Not only take shelter of higher principles, to take one, take shelter of one who is the shelter of higher principles. Take shelter of the, the lotus feet of the personality of Godhead. Just like the image of the mother bird and the two little baby birds. She's extending shelter and they're feeling very good. Get it under her, literally under her wing. Without further delay, you must engage yourself in worshipping the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now we're only going to text 24 and we're done, so I'm going to tell the story. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I have been doing practically since I became a Hare Krishna devotee is wanting to give back to my spiritual master what he gave to me, or the service. I became, uh, my first encounter with Srila Prabhupada was at the university I was attending, and um, he was traveling across the East Coast with uh, Ellen Ginsberg visiting universities. I didn't know who Prabhupada was. But that, that experience of hearing his kirtan had a very profound impact. And there was a center at the end of the, the little program on the campus. He invited others, whoever wants to, go to our center. Um, I visited that center and I became involved in Krishna consciousness through his compassion. So I've been wanting to extend the same back on his behalf. So I've been, that's the motivation behind college outreach for me. So one, of the, one time I was in India visiting a university and uh, I was up real early in the morning and it's real quiet early in the morning. It was at IIT Delhi. And so it's, it's like a big campus and a you know, big wall, it's real quiet, except like even inside the campus there's street dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knows, everybody who's been to India knows what it's like. They, they're very territorial. And you know, it's very manicured lawns and this and that, but you know, don't go near our territory. So early in the morning, but like 4.30 in the morning, because Mongol Arti was at four o'clock at, at, at this place, and, and went out in you know, fresh morning air and so forth. Walked by the dogs. <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> and then you have a chorus of other dogs barking, woof, woof, woof. Some of them stand up. You know, you're just walking by, and it cook cool, guys, you know, just... <laughs> you keep going and then they you know put their heads back down and go to sleep. You come back again and do the same thing again, back again. 
every time you go by, it's not like, I, I'm not interested in your territory, you leave me alone. <laughs> so one morning, um, a professor was going for a morning walk also, and he had a little white French poodle, a little guy, real small, and he had the poodle on a leash, and it was stick in his hand. So I was watching when he went by, the, you know, woof woof, you know, woof woof. But then when they saw the little, you know, meal, this little poodle, they, you know, they, they got really animated and like showed their teeth. <laughs> and the, the professor knew exactly what to do. He picked up the poodle in his right arm and showed the dogs his stick. He stopped and showed the dogs a stick, like this. The dog looked at the stick, they looked at each other, they looked at the stick, they looked at each other, they shrugged their shoulders and went back and like that. No more barking. And the little dog was licking the professor's cheek and his little tail was going like this. Because he had shelter. So what to speak of shelter of one who gives shelter to those who give shelter. That's what Suniti understood. That's the higher principle that Suniti was passing on to her son. If you desire to be seated like your father, like, like your brother, then without envy of Saruchi, execute the true words uttered by her Worship the lotus feet of the Lord. And then she goes on to glorify the lotus feet of the Lord. Um, I'll read it. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is so great that simply by worshiping His lotus feet, your great-grandfather, Lord Brahma, acquired the necessary qualifications to create this universe. Although He, that's Brahma, is unborn and the chief of all living creatures, he is situated in that exalted post because of the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whom even great yogis worship by controlling the mind and regulating the life air. Your grandfather, Swami Bhuvamanu, executed great sacrifices with distribution of charity and thereby with unflinching faith and devotion he worshipped and satisfied the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By acting in that way he achieved the greatest success in material happiness and afterwards achieved liberation, though he hasn't died yet, which is impossible to obtain by worshipping the demigods. So now she's pointing the path to Vishnu or Krishna. My dear boy, you also should take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is very kind to his devotees. Persons seeking liberation from the cycle of birth and death always take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord in devotional service becoming purified by executing your allotted occupation, just situated the Supreme Personality of Godhead in your heart and without deviating for a moment, engage always in His service. So the photograph here is meant to show the principle of showing the, the, the path to, to Krishna. In Chaitanya Charitamrita it's called Vartma, Pradarshaka Guru. Varka means path. Pradarshaka is seeing or showing the path to Krishna. She's in this little section, she's giving the seed of bhakti to Dhruva. Because previously, whatever Dhruva was in his previous life, at this stage he's just, I want a kingdom. I want retaliation, I want revenge, 
She's advised him twice, give it up, give up the revenge. She didn't say give up the idea of the kingdom. But you want the kingdom, you have to go to Vishnu because he can do anything. Vishwanath is saying like this, <clears throat> The Lord is affectionate to his servant. He will have more affection for you, his servant, than the affection of millions of mothers like me. And sure enough, when you have the affection of such a personality, everything desired can be achieved. Fix him in your mind, purified by Bhakti Dharma. So we're almost done. She's going to continue here. Two more verses. My dear Dhruva, as far as I am concerned, I do not know anyone who can mitigate your distress, but the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whose eyes are like lotus petals. Many demigods, such as Lord Brahma, seek the pleasure of the Goddess of Fortune, but the Goddess of Fortune herself, with the lotus flower in her hand, is always ready to render service to the Supreme Lord. And only one more verse and we're done. So, the instruction of Guru Maharaja's mother, Suniti, was actually meant for fulfilling his desired objective. As a mother, she wasn't thinking about her objective, her motherly objective. Her motherly objective was her son's objective. This is, this is um, something that we learned during the last two Memorial Day weekend retreats about empathic communication, those of you that attended that, those seminars. A functional relationship is where you know what your needs are and you are taking responsibility to meet your needs and you have an understanding what another person's needs are and you're, according to your capacity and willingness, you're trying to assist them in seeing to their needs and that's the relationship and vice versa. That's a functional relationship as opposed to the other kind. So she's very, she's a, She's a pure devotee. She has all faith in Vishnu. And she knows several things. She knows that mission impossible becomes possible from Vishnu. Nothing is impossible, as Prabhupada would say. Impossible is a word in the false dictionary. Nothing is impossible. And you want something impossible but it's possible through Vishnu. I don't know anyone else. There's no other person. Go, go for it, Vishnu. Um, her interest as a mother is the well-being of her son. Now, just a little comment. I can't think of a any a adult, parent or not a parent, that can advise a five-year-old boy, you want something mission impossible, go to the forest, find Vishnu, and you'll get what you need. And no samosas either. <laughs> <laughs> no mother's going to do that. No way. No way. Wild animal, they guess, it's, a, it's a jungle out there gnats and mosquitoes and snakes and this and that. And, but she has all faith in Vishnu. And she knows her son well enough to know you don't give no for an answer. He won't take it. He wants a kingdom. He wants a kingdom. I mean, the, the details aren't spoken in these verses, but he wants not just his father's kingdom, better than his father's kingdom, better than his father's 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 kingdom. He's a little boy. And what, is, what does he understand about those things? But she, she knows her son. She's not going to say no. She's saying yes. 
And the only way the yes is possible is this one yes. So later it's described by Narada that all the while that Dhruva was in the forest, she had on the one hand full confidence that Vishnu would protect him and she was praying to Vishnu for his protection. And by her prayer, her well-wishing prayer, he was protected. She was, she's an amazing, you know, we don't imitate Suniti. We don't send our kids to the forest. <laughs> but in principle, we can understand the, the degree of faith that she had. And because of the degree of faith that she had, she was able to pass it on. And Dhruva had all confidence in her. He trusted her, she was trustworthy. Whatever she said, whatever she said, the next life. He considered it carefully, he accepted what she said, and went off to carry it out. Therefore, after deliberate consideration, and with intelligence and fixed determination, he left his father's house. Left means went to the forest, left the palace, looking for Vishnu. There's other Puranas that give this detail, where his mother said, Vishnu, and, and Dhruva said, well, how do I find Vishnu? And she said, I don't know. I'm just, you know, a, a, a queen living over here in, in the company of the king. I don't know how to find Vishnu, but I've been told the sages and great souls, they go to the forest and somehow they find Vishnu. He said, great, I'm going to the forest to find Vishnu. <coughs> and off he went. He doesn't have a clue how to find Vishnu in the forest. Nor did she. She just had faith, and he had faith in her. So, the seed of bhakti, those of you that are parents. The seed of bhakti is something that you transmit, if you have it. And then nourishing that seed of bhakti is also good parenting. You know, it has to be commensurate with your capacity and the child's capacity and circumstances and so forth and so on. But that's, you know, that's the mission of parenting. And it's a mission of friendship. It's the mission of being a teacher. It's the mission of being a head of state. It's the mission of being, having someone who looks up to you. And the, the responsibility that you have in the world is that. So the, this is um, some nice lessons, and I'm going to end abruptly. Nice lessons about responding by having a person that knows how to respond instead of react, and you know, learning how to respond instead of react. That he's still in the reacting mode. He didn't let go of the enmity and get back mentality. But he received um, take shelter vision. That's what he's got going for him. Mixed bhakti. Kingdom and Vishnu. Later the Acharyas say he had both. He had a desire to become a, a, a good devotee from his mother. And he had a I want a kingdom desire. He had both. So let's see if there's some discussion. Important topic. Practical. Either of you. Um, just thinking, had he not had that deep faith in his mom, he would not have taken such a big step That's going correct. to the forest at that young age. That's correct. So the faith is very important yes. in order to go to the next step. Yes. Because guru comes later on yes. in life. That's correct. But when you're born, it's your parents. Yes, that's right. That's right. You got it. So when we did our discussion two nights ago. When you think of Dhruva, what do you think of? One of the, you know, one of the things that everyone said, or several people said determination, 
But faith, incredible faith. You little boy, <laughs> off he goes. <coughs> yeah, yeah, good. So, who was he before he was Drupal? We don't know. Something was there. But there was certainly something in her that garnered his, his <coughs> deserving trust in her and faith in her. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for the wonderful class. Um, um, Maharaj, like, um, that was a very nice point like, um, about responding and reacting, uh, which I have to implement in my life. Mm. Uh, I was thinking like my struggles where I am in responding. Um, sometimes I come across a situation um, like where, where a person is hurting me, okay, one time, two times, three times, okay, after that I cannot, I try to react. So how do I really uh, be in that, um, always be in, the, in that mode where I can respond? <laughs> <laughs> by being Christian conscious. <laughs> when there's uh, when you are full in yourself then you can be without <coughs> exception when you're not full in yourself one time, two times because it's good you know, the mode of goodness is sufficient to not Re react, but so to to, to get to the so there may be a, a, there may very well be in responding the appropriate behavior and speech for you is to show strength. But if you do it from a position of responding rather than reacting, then it's something you choose to do, not something that involuntarily. Like, you know, the animal reflex of defending yourself comes out. So it takes being full within yourself. And that's Krishna consciousness. Or, it's, you know, chapter 5 and chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita speak of on that principle. When there's a happiness within, there's nothing outside that can disturb. Then you may respond in a way to let somebody know that's not really appropriate. Here's a, here's a here's a I, I'm, here's a, a boundary. And please don't cross this boundary, because if you cross the boundary, I may have to take the next step, like leave the place, or whatever, or whatever, or raise my voice, or something. But then you're responding. So, the, how does keep that steadiness? Spiritual strength. Feeling full within yourself. Knowing who you are. That's another way of saying it. Instead of who you are. As long as one identifies with who you are, you can, you know, there's, there's a, everyone has their limits. And one who knows who they are, they're in this transcendental place. So then that, then that person is choosing what's appropriate for this circumstance. Super soul gives that intelligence. Anything else? Yes. The, the pitter patter of this child is louder than your voice. <laughs> Say it again. Maharaj, I was really appreciative of today's discussion, and uh, I really liked the Suniti's how she handled the situation, and it was like such a nice, awesome. such a nice consciousness. And uh, I read it before, but I got deeper realization today when I was listening to you. And one question I had is you mentioned uh, till we are in the bodily concept of life, we get stuck. Yes. I wanted to know how 
We can come out of it. Read right? <laughs> <laughs> Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Practice Bhakti Yoga. That's how. I mean, I, 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 was, I was listening to a lecture Prabhupada was giving in Hyderabad, you know, in 1970 something. And it was chapter 2 Bhagavad Gita, chapter 1 Bhagavad Gita. And he was, he was saying something in a way that it was unusual to hear him say like this. But he was speaking to an Indian audience, obviously. And what, you know, whether his hand gesture indicating the young American European disciples. And he was explaining, you know, you're in, in the land of, born in the land of Punyabhumi. These people over here, you know, they were addicted to sense gratification and material existence. But by hearing from me again and again, and repeating again and again, and hearing it again and again, and again and again, they let go of all those things. The perils of indulging in sense gratification. By hearing it again and again, and taking shelter of their understanding that they're really meant for some other purpose. So, then he was saying, you know, in contrast, people in India, they're going towards the Western ways. So, you know, I, you have, you're going to have to hear from me again and again. <laughs> Basically, he was saying, I'm going to use the same strategy with, with you all. Because the sound vibration is purified, and one has to hear it again and again. So, how is this gradual process? Your question is how to get out of the bottom conception of life. Well, there's the knowledge, and that's at least... Prabhupada would say, at least theoretically or notionally, I'm not the body. And then you live your life according to uh, the vidhis of a life of devotion to Krishna that will help you get out of the misidentification with happiness is found in objects of the senses. And you move to another position. Happiness is found in acts of devotion using the senses to serve the master of the senses. And when, when, experience, when purification and happiness comes, then it's easy to, 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 to stay there. But it's gradual, by proper means. It's not, it's not a mechanical, it's a devotional, but guaranteed process. Yes? Maharaj, uh, you gave one example of uh, Parikshit Maharaj uh, putting a dead snake on the sage. Uh, being a great king and devotee, why he did that? That's a nice question. The answer is, this uh, uncharacteristic behavior of Maharaj Parikshit was inspired by Krishna from within. Why would Krishna inspire that from within? Because the, the, it was part of a, an arrangement so that Maharaj Prakshu would be cursed to die and to demonstrate this is how Kali Yuga begins when those who have medical power misuse for medical power and do something that they should not do. Stringy. But then, so, he could hear Srimad Bhagavatam and go back to Godhead in seven days. And we could hear Srimad Bhagavatam, so that's why he put the snake around his neck. To take his devotee quickly back to Godhead and to give us the opportunity, the perfect hearer, to hear from the perfect speaker, the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it because it's not his nature. The internal potency induced him to do like that, not the external potency. You okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes? Maharaj, um, regarding the reacting and responding, like many times I find myself <clears throat> somewhere in between. <clears throat> like I don't necessarily react 
in the, in the, at that moment or in at that time but there is this feeling of um, being victim uh, of of that situation or something like that and that negative emotion is there um i just, i wanted to know how is that also reacting uh, well you, you know you're human <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, it's, it, you know, it, it's not, let's say, it's not taking shelter of a higher principle. It's a mode of goodness. I'm not impulsively going into a, a, a rage in the moment. It's, you know, it's curved by that quality of goodness. But it's not sufficient goodness to like be forgiving and be accepting and, you know, of. of other higher principles than just forbearance. Mm -hmm. Tolerating is insufficient. It's necessary, but insufficient. One has to go beyond the insufficient and take shelter of some higher principle. And then as that shelter is taken, shadhanagati, then Krishna will give intelligence how to conduct yourself with that situation and all of the complexities of life situations. Vidami Bodhi Yogam Tam Yena Mamo Piyantite. That's that verse. How to go to Krishna is the intelligence how to do that. Because that's what it says here. With intelligence. He's just a little boy. But the, the intelligence was awakened by his mother. So. It's gradual. It's, it's not quick. You have something back there? Mother, uh, like the sloka, the three slokas before, like your uh, mother Sriti was the explaining to Guru Mother that Lord Brahma acquired this many planets through his meditations. So that was med so he was meditating before the creation, like then he moved from the lotus feet, the lotus flower of the Darbada creation. Yeah. He worshipped Vishnu before he became the creator. He was born and some things happened and then he did his tapa, which was worshipping the Lord through his mantra. And then he became well acquainted with the ocean of truth, and then he went through the creation process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the class, Maharaj. Um, but I was like kind of a little bit curious about like the, the when you were talking about the flow chart um, of all the different uh, like um, uh, envy and anger and so yes. on and so forth. So is that? So that that's obviously like what happened when the universe was originally created, but is that what is that like the flow of um, uh, of I don't know, I don't know if emotions is the correct word the flow of um, emotions like when that actually like when you're in, like when you react in real life does yes. it come from that and then exactly those are forces that are out there and if those forces that are out there according to guna and karma cling to you, then you act according to those, but you, you require the forces that are out there, you can't just generate them yourself. Brahma creates the forces available for people that are in forgetfulness of their relationship with the person of Godhead, and then they do, you know, destructive things. Those are forces of destruction, and it's the cataclysmic dis destruction to end the universe, but then there's little, little ones. And its forces acting on us, Buddha and Karma, by the agency of the Creator, Brahma, making them available. Yes? 
mindfulness, if we have mindfulness, then we... This child, can somebody help the child understand they should find another room to make their noise? <laughs> Go ahead, a little louder. Maharaj, you're talking about the fullness, uh, then we have like fullness in the heart. That's what I'm understanding is. Uh, then we try to respond, or uh, like the maturity of responding. Okay. Time. So the fullness, like what I am coming up is like uh, two portions. Like, is that my goal to have that fullness? No. Or that's like, right now also, like I just feel like a lot of bucket with a lot of holes. Uh, coming out, so is, is that like just doing the devotional service, is it, yes. A, yes. Is it like a... Uh, yeah. It's the mood of service brings that sense of fullness. So I have to cultivate the mood of service? Yes. So the cultivation is like whom I am doing the service? Yes. We're not the enjoyer of the... I, I plan to speak about this this coming weekend. Like, you know, not exhaustively, but in different language, and different scriptural references. It, it connects directly with our chanting. What should be the move that we chant? I want fullness. <laughs> <laughs> what do we even know what fullness means to what the speaker wanted is the mode of service. I'll just share a little bit. Bhakti said about this little essay that says <coughs> um, Krishna is, is realized through the tongue, but the tongue that wants to be the enjoyer and the mind that wants to be the enjoyer of the senses reaching out into sense objects can never understand transcendence. It's, it's unavailable. But when the, the mood in the mind and the senses is the pleasure of Krishna, then using the, this other language, the fullness can be, Krishna can be understood. And that's, that's, a, that's a sense of fullness. But it's not like, you know, okay, I'm full, nothing more, thank you, no more Krishna. <laughs> not like that. But, you know, it's the mood of service. It's up in, in each of the things. And then that, you know, going back to this other question. Okay, I'm going to end, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you.